This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. The information presented on this program is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information presented does not create any type of relationship between the hosts and guests and the listening audience. Please consult an appropriate professional for guidance about your concerns. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts, the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Levy Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. The entire state has experienced buckets of wet weather the past couple of days and the entire summer as a whole. While people often worry about flooding and water damage, large amounts of rain affect quality and quantity of breeding habitats for our Mississippi wildlife as well. To talk about his observations during this rainy season, we're going to welcome back biologist Joe McGee to the program. As always, uh, we also want to hear from you about what you're seeing in your neighborhood and in your backyards. And Dr. Major is ready for pet questions. Join our conversation this morning. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Always like to remind you that if you miss Creature Comforts on Thursdays, you can catch a repeat broadcast Saturday mornings at 6. So good morning. Let's uh, start with Libby. Libby, you're still reporting in from Oregon. Uh, Unlike Mississippi, I've heard that you haven't seen rain for a while out west. That's true. Yeah, we wish you could send us buckets and buckets of (laughs) rain, but that's not how it works. We all know. I'm, I'm sorry you're getting too much of a good thing right now. But um, I wanted to join in today on the frog conversation, but we don't have many frogs out here. A dozen uh, species of frogs live in the whole state of Oregon, and we've got um, a couple of frogs and a toad that we can find here in um, Benton County, close to where we live. We've heard them calling in the spring, or we've heard the Pacific tree frogs when we've been in Oregon in the spring. We've not heard them since we've been here. I have, uh, I think I can travel to some woodlands in the evenings and find, or some wetlands, but I haven't done that yet. We have introduced bullfrogs that are a problem, of course, as they are all around the world, really. Uh, One unusual frog, though, we have a northern red-legged frog, and we can't hear them calling because they call only underwater, which I think is pretty cool. But um, obviously, the who needs to hear them is also underwater <laughs> with them, I guess. So the males call underwater. That doesn't attract as many. Um, I don't know why more frogs don't do that now that I think about that, right? It mm-hmm. seems like a great adaptation. They call underwater, and that way their predators don't hear them calling. I didn't thought about that, but that's true. And also, uh, I hope my science is right on this. Wouldn't the sound carry maybe farther underwater than it would on land? Uh, yes, I think so. I know that it, it makes a difference. So, um, yes, they sh- it should be a really good way to communicate. Of course, that's only going to work if they're in their ephemeral ponds, and because fish can also respond to sound, and fish are the primary predators for frogs and toads, I mm. think, everywhere, pretty much. A few exceptions, I'm sure. Uh, of course, uh, birds, uh, herons, and egrets like nothing better than to find a frog or a tadpole to eat. So they uh, they do much better. Frogs in general, amphibians everywhere, do better in general in an ephemeral pond, a pond that's temporary so there are not fish living in them because fish are going to need that permanent water. Mm-hmm. And that's why when they are in a pond, when frogs and, and uh, toads breed in ponds, that have fish, they're generally along the edges. Uh, six to 12 inches of water is a, a, about as deep as you're going to find um, tadpoles. And uh, because the whole attempt is to get away from the fish that are going to eat them. So, uh, what else are you seeing out west? Oh, still enjoying our birds. Uh, let's see some interesting things. Uh, a field close to us has been harvested recently and it had uh, wheat on it and this is I think wheat was well, some kind of a hay they you know that they baled a hay and uh, 
egrets have been out there, some great blues, particularly one that has set up kind of a territory and will run anybody and any dog and anything else off. And he's eating um, field mice. And probably, I don't know what other small, lots of small mammals, I'm sure, are in there. And so he is feasting. And um, I've, you know, heard before that the great blue herons can adapt to eating mammals. Usually we think of them as a fish eater, but they can adapt to eating mammals. And so that's what this one's doing. And we've been watching him. We sometimes see um, sandhill cranes in that field. They're the migratory sandhill cranes here. But um, I haven't seen them this year. I saw the peregrine falcon again this week uh, speeding by me. It was beautiful to see. But uh, and uh, lots of scrub jays. That's a, a, an important predatory bird, I guess, in our area. And uh, we see a lot of black capped chickadees. I've got black chick black capped chickadees just recently fledged one group. I'm assuming that they're probably gonna all be through fledging now out here because it'll start cooling off in September. And uh, they're probably not gonna have too many more babies. I think uh, that I'd also read uh, where this uh, in the Pacific Northwest, the, it, it was warmer than usual. W what are your temperatures like out there? Yeah, uh, we're not having extremely warm weather. This is a cooler summer than we had last year. But uh, like get up early, it's probably 60 degrees outside right now. Okay. And it it's it never warms up until, you know, Warming up being 80 or so, it's not going to get to 80 until the afternoon. Last night, um, by um, 7, 7.30, it was nice and cool outside. It was in the 60s again. That that sounds nice. <laughs> yes, yes. So you get some, you get it, you get it. It's warm enough in the middle of the day that Norman can go swimming, if that means anything, you know. So it's in the 80s. And, but, of course, now we've had some of those temporary times when it's above 100 for several days in a row. It'll still cool off some at night, but um, we haven't had that since July. So we've had a, a – we, we've been lucky. I don't, I don't know that there's any more hot, hot weather to come for us, so we were lucky to miss that this year. As always, uh, Dr. Major joins us from his clinic in Jackson. Uh, good morning, Dr. Major. Dental problems on our mind this morning. Uh, do dogs and cats get cavities like humans do? Not exactly. Uh, dental problems are certainly uh, rampant in both dogs and cats. And what happens a lot of time, and just uh, if you pick your dog's lip up and look at his canines on back to the molars, premolars, uh, you'll find a fairly heavy especially an older dog, fairly heavy accumulation of tartar and plaque. Uh, this causes the gum line to recede and certainly can uh, expose the roots, which do not have enamel, and that can cause a lot of infection and some serious problems. They can have cavities, but cavities themselves, like humans have, are rare. So when we talk about plaque and tartar, what are some ways that uh, pet owners can maybe help kind of control that? You know, some of it is genetic. I've seen some dogs that uh, have had no dental care, uh, seven, eight, nine years old, and had pristine teeth. Uh, some of it may have to do with the food, uh, and that is certainly a, an issue. The owner certainly can actually brush the teeth, uh, I would say that probably less than less than 10% of uh, pet owners brush their uh, pet's teeth. But if you look at the overall scheme, I'd say that 45 to 50% of the pets that we see certainly could have uh, some dental care uh, by the veterinarian. Massaging the gums with a gauze pad, like a surgical gauze, certainly can help. Uh, a lot of dogs will let you do that. Um, they may have some special things that are made for that. But you could take a gauze sponge, wrap it around your finger, and massage the gum line. And if you did that routinely, say, two or three times a week, um, that would help prevent a lot of uh, tartar buildup. There are dental chews. 
some of them are treated and work pretty well uh, to help prevent the buildup of plaque and tartar. When I say plaque, I'm talking about something that's much harder than just staining the teeth. We're talking about something that looks like a tooth almost. It's hard and does require special instrumentation to get off front of the tooth. Yeah, I think anybody, uh, even humans who've had gone to the dentist for their, you know, the semi-annual checkup or whatever, and the, the way they have to kind of sometimes scrape to get that gunk off your teeth, it is pretty hard sure. there. So, um, we, You know, one of the things, the first things that most pet owners, uh, if they're not very cognizant of the dental situation in the animal, they notice an odor. And certainly uh, a mouth that is infected, that has uh, maybe loose teeth, root exposure, that can knock you down just about when you uh, get close to it. It certainly can cause a lot of uh, odor. And what, is, what causes the odor? Bacterial infection. And it certainly can uh, cause some problems, and we can discuss uh, later. But certainly can cause heart and kidney issues because this bacteria can get in the bloodstream and can cause some, some issues. So I would imagine that um, if you do the gauze thing and it uh, helps with the tartar and the plaque, that that is a sort of side benefit, as we talked about, that might improve doggy breath. <laughs> Absolutely. And they have uh, dog toothpaste. Uh, most people try it, and then it kind of goes by the wayside. Uh, they have dog tooth, doggy toothbrushes. Uh, and if you start at an early age doing that, certainly the toothbrush can can work well. Uh, but some dental care and looking and seeing um, and talking to your veterinarian about various ways that you can care for the teeth. But a lot of the dogs will require ultrasonic scaling uh, care and maybe uh, antibiotic in addition to that. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest for today is biologist Joe McGee. If you want to join the conversation with your question or comment, email animals at mpbonline.org. So good morning, Joe. Thanks for joining us today. We always like to hear about your nature observations. So start us off. What have you been seeing around your backyard here recently? Behind my house last Saturday, I saw a really interesting butterfly. This was before the flooding rains that we've had in the last couple of days. It was... Uh, sweltering around noon on Saturday. Uh, temperature was only about 90, only about 90, but the humidity was really high. But I decided to check out a goldenrod patch behind my house, and I saw a little butterfly I've been wanting to see and photograph for a long time. It's called a great purple hair streak. And I did get some pretty good photographs, and I can send you a photograph of it if you'd like, maybe later on. Hair streaks are... Uh, very small butterflies, usually overlooked by most people. You just you just don't notice them; they're so small. But the uh, great purple hair streak, as hair streaks go, is a large butterfly. Very pretty when it's perched. The wings they always close their wings, fold their wings over their over their body, and uh, it has a sort of charcoal gray appearance. If you look carefully, you see these bright red spots at the base of the wings white dots and dashes on the thorax, you know, where the legs and the wings are attached. And if you watch it carefully as it moves around, you'll get a glimpse of a shiny metallic blue. It's not really purple. It's more of a metallic blue color. Really a neat little butterfly. And I was really glad to uh, get some photographs of that one this past Saturday. I almost passed out doing it, though it was so hot. <laughs> This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We're going to be visiting throughout this hour with our friend Joe McGee. Uh, Joe is pretty good at uh, helping to identify things that you might see when you're out and about, maybe in your yard or your neighborhood. So, uh, Joe, how do you think rain affects some of the local critters uh, in, in Mississippi? It affects frogs, frogs and toads, in a profound way. They are creatures of water, right? They have to have uh, water to breed in. Our, our native species do at least a ditch full of water or a depression full of water, a pond. And ordinarily, if you think about it, this time of year, it can be very hot and quite dry. Think about Labor Day. It always seems to me it's always hot and dry. And the breeding season is sort of over for our frogs and toads by then the warm season. When we, then we start anticipating the ones that will breed when the weather turns cool on over, you know, in December. But this event we had this week, they're all, well, my local species are all calling, and I assume when they call, they're looking for a mate, that those are males looking for a mate, and so they're breeding. 
And there's one in particular that I'm, I find very, very interesting. It's the Spadefoot, Eastern Spadefoot. And they don't call unless we get these flooding rains such as we had yesterday. And uh, so I checked out a, a place, a, a pool, a, a depre- it's a depression uh, in a little wooded area that I have in the past heard Spadefoot's calling from uh, when it rained heavily like this. And I did not know for sure if I would even be able to get there. You know, roads were flooded yesterday, but I, did, I went about two in the afternoon. I tried it, and I went drove over, and I didn't have any trouble getting there. I had to take a detour from what I would normally take because one of the bridges has been closed for years. But pull up to the spot, lower my window, and they were calling like crazy, spadefoots, eastern spadefoots. Uh, Joe, tell us, what, what does the spadefoot frog look like? It looks like a toad, and for, for years it was called, they were called spadefoot toads, but they're really not toads. They're in an entirely different uh, family than our toads. And if you look, I sent you a picture, by the way, if you look, of course, the listeners can't see the picture I sent you. If you look at a spadefoot and compare it with a toad, you'll see it has smooth skin, relatively smooth compared to a toad. It, they do have bumps and tubercles on their skin, but it's, a, it's just a different animal. They um, uh, have elliptical pupils, like a cat. Mm-hmm. Now, the picture I sent you, I, you know, there was, it was obviously on a bright light. I had to put a flashlight on. This was from last year. I had to put a bright light on. And the pupils expand uh, in the bright light. So it doesn't look quite as elliptical as they do when they're in darkness. But they're named for a very unique structure they have. They, they're called spade foots because they have spades on their hind feet. And they use those spades to burrow backwards into loose soil, like sandy soil or loamy soil. And they stay in these burrows that they create, sometimes for months at a time, maybe, according to the literature, sometimes even years until a flooding rain occurs, which then triggers them to come out and uh, seek rain pools and breed. Now, they do have to eat, and I've never found one. Uh, out and about between rains, but I know two people who have, and they photograph them. In, they photograph individual spade puts in the daytime. I've not been that lucky, but I think I'm going to check this area where they're breeding uh, by day and see if I can find one uh, out and about, by, maybe on a warm night, because uh, they do have to feed from time to time. They do emerge from the burrows to, to feed, but you wouldn't know it because they're not calling then. The best time to see them is when, the, when they're breeding. So, you know, like I said, the, I did hear part of the, the audio file this morning, and it did sound like there were a lot of them. So I guess if they're having to wait for a, a major rain, when we get one, do they always come out in full force like this? Yes. If it's, uh, I'm told it has to be about a four-inch rain. Now, I got much more than that yesterday, at least four inches of rain. That's a heavy rain. They might come out last, uh, spring, last year around April, late April, or I guess mid-April uh, this year. Uh, we had some heavy rain, and my gauge had 3.5 inches in it. And I decided to check out the spade pool that I know about to see if it had water in it. It had been dry, and it did have water, and they were calling, but it could have rained four inches over there. That's, you know, it's a few miles from my house. So uh, they've got to have flooding rains uh, to trigger this breeding activity, this breeding frenzy that they engage in. Yeah, and so I think you sent us an audio file of that. So, Java, why don't we hear that now? Very active, Kevin. Very active. That's an interesting sound there. It's almost like a groan there. That uh, It's like, oh, please, someone come. I've been waiting in this burrow for a, some heavy rain, so please let me find a mate. <laughs> yeah. It's like gastric distress in a bur- if you're an individual. <laughs> um, and I, I should mention, to, so listeners will understand, you, it's almost impossible to record a single species of frog. There's going to be something else calling, right? Mm-hmm. And this rain we've had, there were squirrel tree frogs calling, and I, I was unable to to get a recording of the spade foot without squirrel tree frogs calling, uh, except in, in, in one brief instant. So uh, in addition to the spade foot, you can hear squirrel tree frogs calling, and every now and then you can even hear a gray tree frog calling. But they didn't uh, really interfere with the, what I was trying to do. Uh, so, Libby, do you have any experience with uh, spadefoots? No, I have not. I've not. Uh, 
I've not lived close to Spadefoots at all. So I'm very interested. I'm going to have to get with Joe when I get back home and uh, see what I can do to remedy that. Yes, they they uh, are said to be statewide in distribution in Mississippi. Supposedly they occur all over the state, but they're not everywhere. It's like anything else. They've got to have their habitat, right? And their habitat, first of all, it has to do with the soil. They have to have that loose loamy or sandy soil that they can burrow into. They're not around my house or anywhere right in my immediate vicinity because the soil is just entirely too dense. It's a clay. It's a dense, tight clay soil. And they can't dig into that. They can't uh, burrow into that no matter how many spades they might have. They just It's not possible. Yeah, so, and I'm right on the edge of the lurch, so this is probably not a good place for them. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Isn't that soil kind of loose? It's different. It's very different. It's clay, but not not like um, you know, not like those Jackson clays. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm not. I'll I'm not do, sure. I'll do some research. We'll figure this out. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, Joe, with all the frogs calling at the same time, again, is it that they are they slightly different, and they're hoping that there is a mate somewhere that kind of picks out their uh, call versus all the other ones going on? I'm not sure how different it is, but uh, by calling, it's sort of a shotgun approach. With all of them <laughs> calling at once, the females don't have to look far, right, to find a, a mate. And uh, the males, will they will actually grab anything. They'll grab your hand to find one. So, or toad, I can't say for sure about space, but our, our bufo toads or our uh, Anna, Anazirus toads will... They'll try to make with your hand if you if you put it in front of them. Uh, so they're not real discriminate about uh, who me too, I guess. But in that way, I would think the large number of males might each sort of helping each other out because it's kind of like if the, if the females hear all that racket, they know something's going on and the, and they go to investigate, I guess. Right, exactly right. Yes, and I noticed though it was very interesting when I it was broad daylight when it was, but it was raining when I got to the to the pool to the for the spade foot breed, and I could hear the uh, squirrel tree frogs calling, and I didn't at first recognize what they were. They had frogs have different calls, and those squirrel tree frogs initially had a very different call, and as the, as the afternoon progressed, they finally resorted to the call that I'm more familiar with. So they can change their their calls, I guess, over time. I'm not sure spade puts do that. I just hear one thing from them, one sound from the spade puts. We're going to go to Oxford because Cynthia is on the line. Thanks for waiting, Cynthia, but it's your turn now, so go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Um, it was interesting what you said about the frogs liking loose soil because I was repotting some things, and when I <laughs> dumped out a pot, there was a little frog that had burrowed down in there, and, of course, it hopped off. Um, but that was that was a nice uh, discovery, <clears throat> and we do have lots of uh, frogs in the neighborhood because we have a creek that runs through. It's a seasonal creek, um, and every time it rains, it's got some puddles, and then they dry up. So I imagine that would be good for frogs. Um, but I was wondering about mosquitoes and whether frogs eat mosquitoes, and whether you know, some of the sprays that you see people doing in their yards for mosquito control would uh, be harmful for the frogs. Just wondering about that relationship. Thank you. Yes, for frogs will eat mosquitoes, but I'm not sure they are an effective mosquito control. But they'll eat almost any insect that they see that you know, comes in their vicinity. But I don't, I don't think they are necessarily uh, a good in, a mosquito control agent. Well, I guess it helps some, um, but yes, they do eat mosquitoes. And then is there a danger if, uh, uh, what what sort of danger does the uh, p pesticides pre pre present for, for nature? Well, if it kills the ins enough of the insects, the frogs won't have anything or have, it'll reduce their food supply. Uh, it, it can be uh, iffy for them. I, I can't address all the issues. I, uh, I know I at a museum in, I believe it's in Pascagoula, when I used to travel down that way a lot, I saw some frogs that had 10 legs and that sort of thing and you preserved in the museum. I don't know what causes that. Uh, I'm not saying pesticides do, but if something must cause the, a mutation like that. That's one possible effect. Mm -hmm. 
All right, uh, Cynthia, thanks for your call. Appreciate you calling in this morning. Uh, so Joe uh, Java has some frogs in his area, his yard, and so he recorded them, and we were hoping that maybe you could give uh, Java a heads up on what he was listening to. Okay, give it a listen. Give it a play. And this was just like out in my driveway after the big rain yeah. the other day. And the, the yeah. frogs, they were just calling, calling, calling. Yes. That's great. And you live in the, in the city limits? Yes, sir. I'm in the city limits. Those are gray tree frogs. Actually, they're probably, there's two species of gray tree frogs. And the one that is most common in Mississippi, most, most widespread, I do believe is Coke's gray tree frog. And I believe that's what you've recorded. One of my favorite frogs. I had them calling over here, too. Uh, yeah, Cope's great tree. Did you see any of them? Were you able to actually see any of them? I wasn't able to see them because when I would, and it was so funny because when I would venture out, I was on the porch and I recorded it. That's why you could hear like the rain falling off of the porch. Right. But um, when I would like take any steps <laughs> into the yard or anything, it's like they were like, uh-oh, something's, something's <laughs> happening. So we, so it went silent. <laughs> and then yeah. I would step back on and then they would just start back calling back and forth. What you have to do uh, is you have to move slowly and somewhat in a fluid manner with, with wildlife. Quick, jerky movements frightens them, or, you know, and when you first appear. So if you slowly approach the area where the sound is coming from and, uh, and stand still, if you can do that for a while, it may take you know, a minute, a minute and a half or, to they decide everything's okay. They forget about you, apparently, you know, or you're, you're a part of the surroundings, and, and they'll start up again. And with a, with some, it takes a lot of effort to find them though, and to photograph them. But I have been able to do that at night. But that's a, that's a good recording you've got there of gray tree frogs, copes, gray tree frogs. I'm pretty sure, and um, and I'm I'm impressed that they are in, in within the city limits there. That's good in city limits of Jackson. That's great. Now let me ask you this, Joe. Was it the? I guess it may be a, a silly question, but. Where were they before the rain? Because normally it's, you know, it's pretty quiet outside. I'm, I may hear mm-hmm. one maybe, but yesterday or the day before yesterday, it was it seemed at least about five or six of them or even maybe more. Um, so are they in, in the ground or just in another location? No, the, the tree frogs are, as their name suggests, in the trees or in, in bushes. Uh, every, you know, they're hard to when you know when it's not raining it's daytime and whatnot but every now and then i do i was going to trim off a limb of an oak tree because it was shading a plant i don't need to be that shaded and i was going to trim it off uh, a few weeks ago and i pulled the limb down and i on perched on the or sticking to the limb was a gray tree frog and so i left things alone but i think that's where they are they're on and in trees on you know substantial uh, shrubs that sort of thing. And when the rains come, they come down, whereas the spade puts come up, you know, come up in the soil. If you start looking, and young people can, are really good at this because their eyes are a lot better than old folks' eyes, they can find these things in the daytime. But they're the, the gray tree frogs are very well camouflaged. They look like part of the branch. They look like lichen on the tree branch. Java, I, I credit you on that that recording. I like the fact that you could hear the rain and everything. It really added to the the mood there uh, of uh, of listening to the frogs. And Joe, the other interesting thing to me is we heard the spade foots, and they seemed very uh, not as laid back maybe as the gray tree frog. It, it was like you know a very a real excitement and, and the groaning and that sort of thing. And the, the gray tree frog seemed much more relaxed. It's interesting to me such variety in the various calls that the various frogs have. That's true. The gray tree frogs conjure up, you know, uh, uh, just a long, wet summer afternoon, uh, drifting into the twilight and night. They, they call really most enthusiastically after dark. I mean, they really are calling. But, yeah, I think you're right. There's, there's a sense of urgency in the spadefoots. Because mm-hmm. remember, the ones I recorded yesterday, I don't, they could be calling right now. I haven't been over there today, but they could be calling as we speak. But, you know, in a day or two, this, I hope this rain will end. And they may not be able to breed again for a year or more. 
or they could breathe. You know, we just don't know. It just depends when on when we get up. You got to strike while the iron is hot, I guess, right? <laughs> there you go. Uh, let's get but some. I, go ahead, Joe. I, I, just, just one little comment about Cynthia's the frog that she found in the potting soil. Mm-hmm. I don't know the story of her potting soil or the plant that she was working with and, and whatnot, but that may have been a greenhouse frog, which is uh, an introduced species. I don't know that it's a problem, but they have shown up in in Jackson and other places and on the coast in Mississippi. I don't. I've never encountered one. Uh, over my way, but uh, I don't know for sure that's what it was. But she said it was in the soil. Mm-hmm. It could have been on top of the soil, if she, and she might not have noticed it till she, you know, poured the soil out. But it could that could have been a greenhouse frog. We've got some callers to get to. Let's start in Starkville. Williams on the line. Good morning, William. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, I was. Uh, you were inviting uh, wildlife experiences. I could fill your whole hour with wildlife experiences, but I really. <laughs> Because of the topic was frogs, I was going to ask uh, Dr. Ron Altig, who was one of uh, Denzel Ferguson's graduate students 50 years ago, used to come to my farm. In fact, Denzel owned, I bought Denzel's farm, and they used to come out there and look for duck-voiced frogs, or listen for them, I guess. And uh, I don't know that I ever saw one, but I heard them many, many times. But let me just tell you about, about Ferguson. Uh, he, he and his graduate students discovered in about 1960 uh, the uh, resistance that vertebrates could build up against pesticides and herbicides in the in the um, delta, and it happened because the students were out there looking for for specimens uh, one summer day and found a uh, found a. a, a pool, pond, a pool loaded with gambrosia, which are little tiny minnows, and uh, they filled up their minnow buckets with gambrosia to take them back to feed a cottonmouth, uh, pet cottonmouth uh, moccasin that they kept in the li- uh, biology department. William, are you with us? Oh, sorry. William, we lost you there. Thank you for calling in, though. Uh, Joe, did you recognize, I can't remember, they said a duck something frog. Have you ever heard of that one? Uh I think the name has changed. Ah. I don't use the term duck-voiced frog. I think he's referring to bird-voiced tree frog, another favorite of mine. And uh, I can see the recordings of that one. That one I have managed to record and photograph. Real neat little tree frog found in uh, vegetation like willows and button bush that overhang water. It takes some doing to... uh, to photograph them because they don't they don't well they'll call in the daytime but you'll never find one i don't think in the daytime they're they're up high in the trees but i think he's talking about bird voiced tree frogs i don't know the term duck voiced tree frog or frog i, I i'm not sure what he's I, it just makes sense to me they would be bird voiced tree frog and at one time they may have been called duck voiced tree frog by the way i i took a course from dr ferguson one time years ago <laughs> Uh, let's uh, stay on the phone lines. We'll go to Rachel in Eupora. Good morning, Rachel. You're on the air with us. Good morning. Enjoying the show, Thank as you. always. So uh, I would like somebody to explain the difference between frogs and toads. Okay. Actually, there is no difference in a way. They're, they're all frogs. All toads, now listen carefully, all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll think about it. Maybe it will. <laughs> yeah. Say it again. Okay. And, I, and then I'll, I'll make it a little easier. I, what I said was all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. For instance, some frogs are frogs, right? Some frogs are the so-called true frogs, like a leopard frog or a bullfrog or a green frog. But some frogs are toads, like southern toad or fowler's toad the old genus i really like the old genus name for them with bufo so simple and easy to remember b-u-f-o it's been changed but uh the, the little toad frogs that you saw as a child those are toads and they're often referred to if you look in a field guide or a book on on uh, amphibians they'll call them true toads they refer to true toads and true frogs true frogs are Streamlined in appearance, very smooth skin, and they are prodigious leapers. You walk around the edge of a pond and you get close to a frog, it leaps several feet, you know, six feet maybe, into the water, five or six feet into the water. Toads are hoppers, right? They're squatty. Their skin is somewhat dry. 
uh, they once they become adults, they live further away from bodies of water, perhaps, than frogs do. A little less tethered to water than frogs. But they have that squatty, warty appearance, dry skin, uh, and they hop. They, they don't leap nearly as far as, uh, as frogs. And that allows you to get a good photograph of them if you approach them very slowly. They, don't, they sort of stay in place. Does that help you, uh, Rachel? Yes, I understand now. And uh, toads don't cause warts. Yeah, just kidding, but yeah. <laughs> but toads yeah. are the little fat guys. Yeah, usually. We, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. find them in your flower bed, and they don't go far. When you find one, you say, "Aha, there's a toad!" And it, you, you know, you can call the young people or the grandchildren or the children, or whatever, and show it to them. With a frog, it's a little different. You start trying to show it to folks, and by the time they get there, it's gone. <laughs> uh, they, Joe, they're, Joe, they're prodigious leapers. Yeah. Yeah, Joe. Yes. I just thought we might add that um, when you think about their life cycle, because uh, toads and frogs both lay their eggs in water, and they both have that tadpole stage. Right, yes. That's, uh, th and that's why they're all frogs, right? Toads are frogs. Right, frogs. yeah. They're all similar in that way, yes. Yes. Uh, and we black. forget about that. Toads um, and frogs both have spend some species a good portion of their life as tadpoles. Yeah, like a, a bullfrog, you know, that's probably our largest frog in Mississippi. It can, yes. can take as long as two years, sort of temperature uh, dependent, but they can take as long as two years to change from tadpole to adult frog. Yeah, and in the western states, uh, they can stay tadpoles almost their whole life and then just yeah. emerge for a short time as a toad or yeah. a frog. Yeah, by the way, I was thinking about this a while ago, and I'm glad you uh, chimed back in. There is a spade foot in Oregon. It's, it occurs in Washington and Oregon, if I'm not mistaken. I think the Great Basin spade foot occurs in, in, in Oregon. Exactly. Uh, yes. Well to your east. Uh, yes. You know, yeah, the, across the mountain. You're on the western side of the Cascades. Yes, I am. And yes, that's true. The Great Basin spade frog, spade foot is um, generally in the drier parts, but in springs and, and ponds and lakes. But they can burrow in and stay for a couple years if they have to in a burrow yeah. as an adult. Right. Or right. if, you know, if the inverse is true and there's plenty of water, they can continue to be a, a tadpole for a long time. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the reason spadefoots have this burrowing behavior it's believed that they evolved in very dry environment desert environments even they're found worldwide in the northern hemisphere if i'm not mistaken in, and often in desert regions there's one or at least one in europe uh so uh it's not surprising that you would have one in the great basin but you really yes. have to make a check to see it not to seek it out yes this is creature comforts on mpb think radio rachel thanks for your call Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. We've been visiting throughout this hour with our friend biologist Joe McGee. We had a little technical snafu, and William dropped off, but he's back on the line. So, William, thanks for calling back in. If you would, go ahead and continue what you were talking about. Yes. I, um, just by the way, I, I may be able to uh, locate Dr. Uh, Altig and find out uh, uh, the story about or more facts about the duck voice frog but i was telling the story about the uh denzel ferguson's graduate students coming back with a, uh, a, a minnow bucket full of gambrosia from the delta uh out in cotton country there and uh when they got back to the uh, university they uh, went straight to the basement of the biology department and and fed the cottonmouth moccasin there two or three of these gambrosia and uh, paid no further attention until they, they went to leave and locked up, locked up the lab. And they looked over, and the cottonmouth had rolled over and died uh, very quickly and happened in something less than half an hour after I don't know how many of the gambrosia it ate, but it certainly ate one. And the the uh, gambrosia was so was so intoxicated with with uh, herbicides and mm -hmm. and uh, and pesticides from the Delta that they said that they had an LD50, which meant that any 
half of any other animal that ate that had a blood content of, of pesticides that high, half of them would die, LD50. But anyway, these things were so so much greater than that that they, that it killed the cottonmouth mountains in, in, in minutes. Hmm. And I just uh, have always thought that that's an absolutely amazing story. Yeah, that's, that yeah. is. Yeah. And let me, I guess that uh, underscores the need to be careful when we use pesticides. Yeah, that's a very dramatic example of what certainly happens. And uh, we think it you know, may happen all the time. And to think that anything that we eat that may be exposed when you start pulling up our food chains, that um, that's why we, uh, we want to keep our bodies of water really clean, right? If we're eating fish, we want to be sure that um, they've not bioaccumulated um, pesticides in their bodies. Uh, what the interesting aspect of this was that they, the f- simple fact that vertebrate uh, animals, these little fish, had built up such a resistance to, to the toxins that they were able to live despite the fact that they were, they were mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> intoxicated to the point that, that they'd kill anything that ate them. That, that was an yeah. amazing discovery. Yeah, and they bioaccumulated that in a short time because Gambusia don't live very long. No, that's right. All right, William, thanks for calling back. Interesting story, and and, and that certainly adds to the the conversation this morning. Uh, Joe, we've got about uh, just a couple of minutes left. Was there any other sort of uh, frog or toad that you wanted to briefly mention? Well, I did want to mention one thing. During the break, Tom Mann from the museum called me, and he suggested, and I think he may be right, that the frog that or that Cynthia, I think her name was Cynthia, at Oxford found in her flower pot right. may well have been a toad. Okay. Uh, it, they can get into flower pots. I should have thought of that. They can and do get in flower pots. Could have been a young one. They, you know, there's can be smaller than our quarter uh, when they first uh, uh, change from tadpole to toad. So it, she may have very well had a toad in her pot. Joe, I looked up an old reference, and it called a um, a duck-voiced, called it a wood frog. Wood frogs? Well, they, they're not known to be in Mississippi. No, that's, yeah, so that's something different, they, unless there was a rare occurrence that they were trying to check out. Yeah, they're, they do make, you know, they make that quacking sound, but they're not, a yeah. Mississippi, not on the Mississippi frog list that, is, that I'm aware of. No, I don't think so. Yeah. But that might that may solve the the, the uh, question that we're talking about. All right. Yeah. The, the, the whole thing about names is in, is in a state of flux right now. And it can be very confusing. In our final minutes here, just always a reminder that if you see something when you're out and about uh, in your yards or neighborhoods and can't figure out what it is, you can always send us a picture, and we can uh, use our vast network of resources to f- try to help you figure out what that is. So remember, you can always send something uh, when the show is not on to animals at mpbonline.org. Creature Comforts is a production of MPB Think Radio. Funding is provided in part by listeners. So to hear today's show or previous show, you can visit Creature Comforts mpbonline.org. Our show was produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener today was Charles Arnold. For Libby Hartfield, Dr. Troy Major, and our guest Joe McGee, I'm Kevin Farrell. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts that's heard only on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org.